My novel Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter is uh, set in Mississippi. It's about two men who knew each other as boys. Silas 32 Jones is um, a small town black constable and Larry Ott's a small town white mechanic. And uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, they had a brief friendship. And this being Mississippi, one being white, one being black, the friendship wasn't an easy thing. And it was so kind of a secret friendship they had for a few months. And uh, after that, Larry, the mechanic's son, um, takes a girl on a date to the drive-in movie, and she's never seen again. He and Silas stop being friends. Silas leaves, plays baseball at Ole Miss, drives, uh, you know, sees the world, and then comes back home 20 years later, back to Mississippi. And uh, Larry's a mechanic with no customers and no business and no friends. He's lived under the suspicion all these years of perhaps he murdered that girl. But never, he never confessed, and they never found a body, so he's just lived a really lonely life. And now, in 2007, with Silas back as a constable, another girl's disappeared, and Larry's blamed again. And Silas feels himself pulled back into Larry's life for the second time. This novel, I, uh, I started several years ago, back in 2003. The spark back then wa uh, was just two brothers with a problem. It's come a long way since then. Um, uh, now it's become two friends as opposed to two brothers. And um, another spark, uh, actually th this was a collection of sparks that finally equaled this novel. Another spark was I grew up in Alabama in a small town or near a small town called Fulton. I, I grew up in Dickinson, which was a hamlet, which is a crossroads store. And that was, that was the whole, t that was Dickinson, a crossroads store and uh, the railroad track. And the train didn't stop there which is how you knew it wasn't a town. If it's a town, the train stops. So I grew up in Dickinson, but two miles away was Fulton, which was a mill town, giant mill, and the spate of stores that would have opened around a mill, a barber shop, you know, a store, a bank, and so on. And uh, this place, uh, Fulton and Dickinson, had one police officer. And I was always fascinated by the idea of one man being the whole justice for you know, his jurisdiction, whatever it might be, three, four very small rural areas. So I liked that idea. Also, the idea, there's a garage that I know of in Alabama, and I've gone by there hundreds of times without ever seeing a customer. The mechanic's always there, no customer. So I, I just, that's really uh, lingered with me. So all these sparks kind of got together and made a little fire and, um, and became this novel. Now, I'm from Alabama, near Mobile, and this novel set in Mississippi. The reason for that is simply the title, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, which is uh, how Southern children are taught to spell Mississippi. M-I, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter I, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter I, Humpback, Humpback I. And I thought, what a great title, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. I like the word crooked. It's um, a strange word with two syllables, and I like the Ks, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. Also, but it, because of that, it's a very Mississippi title, so I moved everything from Alabama. I took my whole county and slid it west because southwest Alabama and southeast Mississippi are really alike in landscape, so I didn't lose anything with that. But the title um, sounded like a, an Elmore Leonard title, kind of a crime title. I hope Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter opens with a bang. Um, it, there, it opens with, a, with a, um, a man being shot, and the novel then goes back, and we see why he was shot and who he was, and uh, ultimately that he should not have been shot, I think. But um, I, do, I think the violence does, um, in, in a way, is uh, juxtaposed to the very pastoral setting. But also, um, in a, a community like this, in a small town community, when there's a violent act, it is often amplified because uh, everyone knows everybody and everyone knows this, this person who's been the victim of violence or the perpetrator of violence. So it, it's, it's, um, it really resounds in the community. What I hope will surprise readers about this novel is the relationship between 32 Jones and Larry Ott, who were friends uh, 25 years ago and, and now are forced together again. And the things that broke them apart 20, 20, 20 or 25 years ago were terrible things. And I, 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 it's things that I'm not sure can be over, could be overcome by, you know, certain people would not be able to get past what happened to those two boys in 1982. Here, 20 years later, they are forced to confront this. Um, I want readers to be surprised by what happens with them. Um, you know, just
The book, in a way, is about the past, how the past always reaches back into the future, uh, or not back into the future, the, how the past reaches into the future and gets you. Faulkner said the past is not over, it's not even past. The past is not dead, it's not even past. It's always with us, and I think that is um, a big theme about this. What inspired me to become a writer, um, honestly, is I really couldn't do anything else. I tried many things. I tried computers back in the early 80s when they were brand new, when everyone had a, Vic a Commodore or Vic 20, and I couldn't even do the math for a Commodore or Vic 20. Uh, I, I failed as a mechanic. My father's a mechanic. My uncles are mechanics. My brother's a mechanic, cousins. Uh, and uh, I tried really hard. He wanted me to be a mechanic. He brought me to his shop every day in the summer, and after school I worked there. But I always had a love for stories, and I grew up hearing my father and uncles tell stories. And I noticed as they talked, for instance, my uncle, who, uh, my uncle D, who was also a mechanic, shot a deer one year, and I'll never forget this. He had not killed one in a long time, and hunting was very important in our family. So his not having killed one was a source of um, embarrassment to him. So uh, he, when he did kill one, he was so excited. And I listened to him tell the story eight or nine times in a row. He would tell it to whoever was listening. The audience may change. I mean, we were out by his pickup truck uh, cleaning the deer. He would tell the story, and someone else would walk up, and he would tell it again. And I noticed the story evolved, subtle changes. His details got better as he told it. Uh, it, it got, you know, he, had, he had to track the deer. It got, you know, the distance he tracked it got farther with each telling of the story. I just, and I remember noticing this is how you tell a story. You practice it. You get it right. You tell it, tell it and tell it again and again and again. And that's true for fiction. You often don't know the story when you start. I didn't know a lot of the details of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter when I began to write it. But things, things surprise you and you learn who the characters are as you go with them. So I think having grown up in an environment where people told stories really helped me. And my favorite blurb ever about me it was from my book, Poachers, my first book, a collection of stories. This was, I think, from the Dallas Morning News. The reviewer said, if Flannery O'Connor and Raymond Carver had gotten drunk together and produced a love child, he might have been Tom Franklin. That one I liked. Yeah, this novel is very autobiographical in a couple of ways. First, uh, the character Larry Ott, as I wrote him, I, I became alarmed at the number of things that he and I had in common. I've never written so autobiographically in my life. Uh, Larry and I are both mechanics' sons. We both grew up in a rural place, uh, but then and those you know, and um, going to the same kind of church. And uh, Larry has Silas as as a black friend, and I had a black friend, and we, it, we were not really at ease among other people. If we were alone, we would draw comic books together and have fun together around other people. We weren't quite able to do that. Larry has a very sad life. He lives by himself. His father's dead. His mother has Alzheimer's and she's in a nursing home. He has no friends and uh, is incredibly lonely. Um, as a child, he was unpopular, as I was unpopular as a child. For instance, once Larry, Larry brings a monster mask to school on Halloween to try to gain popularity. I did this. I had a great monster mask. It cost 30 bucks in 1978 or something. Imagine how great it was. It had real hair, an eyeball that dangled, all this gore. And I worked to school one day on Halloween and everyone suddenly liked me. They wanted to try on my mask. And you know, I, I got it back and put it on. It smelled like the girl who'd had its breath. And it just it titillated me all over. They invited me that night to a haunted house they were putting on in a local Baptist church. And I'd never been invited to something out before with other people from school and I was shocked when I went there that they were there and I realized these people that I see at school every day hang out apart from school. I didn't. I went home far out in the country, hung out with my brother or my cousins and I didn't realize that cliques existed. I came out of the haunted house, took off my mask, triumphant. I'd had a good three hours of scaring people and no clique would invite me over. I stood there and no one called me and finally just walked off alone, which Larry does. I would like readers of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter to come away with the idea of hope that no matter how bad it was in the past, it can be better and healing can still occur. I mean, I think it's a novel about healing, ultimately.